first of all, hi. Oh, smart system. Um, I'm really excited to, to welcome you all and to thank you all for being here. I'm really excited that there's a large crowd. Um, my name is Ahmed Rashid Al Khattabi. I go by ANR for short. I'm the Associate Director of the Environmental Finance Center here at uh, University of North Carolina. We're based out of uh, the School of Government. And I'm one of the three co hosts <coughs> hosting this side event. Uh, with me is Greg Pierce from UCLA and Kelsey Piper from Northeastern uh, College of Engineering. And they'll, they'll each introduce themselves in turn and talk a little bit about uh, what they see as important topics in this space. But I'll just go ahead and say a few remarks before handing it over to Kelsey and Greg, and then I'll come back and say a few words. Um, I'll just say that I'm really excited not only for the sheer number of people in this room, um, but to discuss a topic that I feel is uh, not given that much importance in the United States, and also to be talking about a topic that, well, it's it's a topic that is typically in my mind discussed on in a in a in a global South context, not necessarily one in the United States. And I think that's particularly significant saying that here at, a, at the Water and Health Conference that is primarily based, primarily oriented towards the global South. Um, and it's a really exciting opportunity to, to get people in, a, in, in the same room that maybe you typically work in parallel and perhaps explore opportunities for, for, for joint research or to, to, to think about topics that there are, you know, there's a convergence here that's really exciting to explore. Um, I will also say that it's the top, the timing of this uh, conversation or the side event is particularly exciting as well. Um, we're in a moment where there's increased public awareness around uh, the difficulties and the financial struggles that a lot of water systems in the United States are facing. Um, and it's, uh, oh, and, and all the funding that's necessary to, to get access and to safe and affordable drinking water to folks in this country. Um, so with that, I'll just quickly overview what to expect from this side event. Um, if my clicker decides to work, and it does not want to work. There we go. Um, so introductory remarks, I just started, uh, well, I will hand it over to Kelsey for the first introductory remark, uh, and then Greg and then myself, followed by lightning talks. We've invited some folks doing some very exciting work in this space, and I'm very excited to hear from them. Um, I think we're going to plan for a few minutes discussion after that to get impressions from all of you folks, uh, and then we'll have uh, breakout discussions. As you can see on the on the on, we have three different topics: scaling interventions, water quality, and community resilience. So three different areas where you can congregate to and have a conversation. So it's meant to engage all of you in conversation. And time uh, time permitting, we'll do report backs and, and close up. Uh, so with that, Kelsey. All right. Who's oh, working? Yes, I knew I was going to forget this. That's why I had a slide. We have a sign in sheet. Um, I'd love to, to. I'm going to start handing over here. So if you guys write your name, and if uh, we run out of space, just it's right on somewhere where there's blank space. Um, All right. Woo. Love the enthusiasm. <laughs> All right. Um, so Aaron Greg asked me to kind of orient people. We're gonna have a lot of great lightning talks. So I don't even know into much 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 more detail. So I'm supposed to give a broad overview of if you know nothing about decentralized systems, private wells, whatever language you want to use, I'm gonna give you the broad over introduction. So a lot of this comes down to law. We look at the Safe Drinking Water Act, and they specifically exclude systems that do not serve 25 individuals regularly, which is about 60 days per year or have at least 15 service connections. Any system that does not meet that is considered a domestic well, a private well, a private system. There's a lot of different words being used by different federal agencies, but that's all kind of under this bucket that these systems are not regulated. We can see that they are regulated at the state level to some, to some degree. Usually it's with new construction. So when we start talking about long-term drinking water quality, there usually is not there. So this is leading to a lot of different problems, which we will hear about today. Um, and it's a big portion of the population. It's not trivial. There's not great numbers because we don't have data on this, but EPA says about 23 million. Other groups have said like 47 million residents. So we're talking tens of millions of people. So not trivial. So kind of as we talk about lightning presentations, I thought it would be just to orient, why do we see different water quality problems? So if we think about water quality, the first thing that's going to influence what we see in these studies is what is being supplied by the geology that's going to dictate the groundwater supply, and that usually is untreated and going into the homes. So what you can see is a lot of studies have been done thinking about what we know from the USGS perspective. We've got 
usually about nine main aquifers that we look at that can have hard water, uh, more corrosive water, and all of those are going to dictate how water interacts with the bedrocks and then subsequently through the system. And so that's really going to drive a lot of the differences we see between the states that are reporting on low water quality. The other piece that's really important is thinking about what type of system we're sampling when we talk about private systems. So most commonly what we have are drilled wells. These are done by someone with drilling equipment, usually a licensed driller. They tend to be a lot deeper. They can be done in any geology. Our shallow systems that sit in our water tables, they're called water table aquifer wells, drilled wells, bore wells. Again, it really depends on where you're located. But these are shallow systems. They usually don't go more than 30, maybe 50 feet, whether you're hand digging, augering, or you're pushing the system in. They are in low yield aquifers. They are, are usually our most contaminated systems. And then, again, if you're talking about wells or versus all systems, we have a lot of work with uh, springs, whether roadside springs or people that have them on their home in uh, box, boxes and collect that water and divert that into the home. So we can start to see we have a lot of geology and a lot of different system types. And then we add in the human behavior piece. We then have people, whether or not they want to add treatment, whether they know they even have a, uh, have a private well. We often ask, do you get a water bill? And that's how you distinguish who's on a municipal system versus a private well. And so all of these things coming together start telling us a lot about water contamination issues. But these nuances are really important as we start thinking about this holistically across the US. So. For the main contaminants we're going to see, so another piece is looking at where is the contamination actually coming from, because this is going to influence how we sample. So we have a lot of geogenic contaminants that we're concerned about, like here in North Carolina, we worry about things like arsenic and iron. Uh, there's a lot of issues with surface water contamination. When your system isn't properly constructed, water can infiltrate. We think about pesticides and bacteria. And then we always have to think about premise flowing, where you can introduce more microbial contamination, but also things like corrosion, lead and copper being released. All of this can be mitigated through home treatment, but we have to think about what the users' uh, adoption practices are and their maintenance behaviors are. And then the last piece I'll end with, um, just again, some things that we think about when we start looking at the lightning talks would be that scale impacts all of this. So we can start seeing studies about the, you know, what's going on in the nation all the way down to a community, and your rates are going to change based on who you included and who you didn't include. But overall, working with Leanne, so I did my PhD with Leanne, so she's seen all of these slides. But so when Leanne and I did a study, we actually found that about 6% uh, of wells, or oh, it should be three and five, I did my math that, about 6% of wells exceed one, one health-based standard. So if you were a municipal system, most people would be out of compliance. And this is just for the basics, like lead, copper, bacteria. When we start talking about PFAS, Chrome 6, those we don't have a good handle on, but basically these systems are usually probably problematic in terms of uh, water contamination and impacting our health. So with that as an overall thing, I went my two to three minutes. There you go. Okay, I lied. I, th I thought Greg was going after you. Uh, or sorry, before I'm back. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about some of the work that EFC has done uh, with funding from the North Carolina Collaboratory on decentralized and uh, supporting disadvantaged decentralized systems or uh, users in North Carolina. Uh, we had two project directors work on this, Hope uh, Thompson in the room. I'm very grateful that she's here with us. Uh, and Alicia Eastwell Frazier, who unfortunately cannot be here today. Uh, but uh, I just want to quickly say that you know, this work in North Carolina is quite significant. Um, in North Carolina, North Carolina ranks among the highest in the country for disadvantaged decentralized users. Just in terms of you know, some numbers, in, in, in North Carolina, over half of the population is on a private domestic well or a septic system. Um, and that compares to 15% for private domestic wells nationally versus an 18% uh, for septic nationally. So these numbers are, are a lot higher. Um, and most of these users are, dis are considered disadvantaged. Um, so when we think about how to tackle this issue and how to support these users, the uh, predominant approach is to connect these users to a centralized uh, system. Um, from a utility perspective, there may be two issues with that. The first is identifying the users themselves. So you you, have, you brought up a nice thing about asking someone who gets their water bill. That's a great one. Um, but when, when you first think about, you know, the first thing that comes to mind when you think about identifying users, I think the most obvious case is people that live right outside a municipal boundary system. But there are tons of people that live technically within uh, a boundary that live in so-called pocket communities that don't actually are not actually connected. 
And identifying these users is quite challenging. I mean, it not only requires technical like GIS, but it also just requires global knowledge to be able to create a map like the one you're seeing on the slide. And we did a ton of work doing making making that map. Uh, the second is uh, is is the cost to, to users or the cost to the households or sorry the cost to the utility um, for connection. So in North Carolina in 20, 2011, uh, an annexation law was passed and it requires uh, a municipal a municipality to pay the cost of infrastructure to extend infrastructure to an area that meets certain disadvantaged uh, criteria. And that is, uh, in many cases, not feasible for a lot of citizens that are struggling financially. Uh, they struggle to pay for their own, uh, uh, cover their own capital uh, capital costs, let alone uh, extend. And sometimes, you know, these these systems also struggle with applying for funding to extend uh, extend their infrastructure. Um, when we think about it from a, a user perspective or a household perspective, you know, there are users that have the option to connect. And these options, these these households have to consider trade-offs, right? They have a, a, a mental cost benefit analysis to do. You know, if they want to stay disconnected, they need to consider the cost of perhaps installation uh, of well or septic systems. They definitely need to talk about it unless they you know purchased it, uh, you know, inherited it. They need to maintain it. Um, they also there's some learning costs associated. They have to learn, they have to, if they don't already know, they have to become comfortable and know how to maintain it. Um, they have to maintain, you have to maintain strict regulator, keep up with regulations, or you know, loop pretend, or perhaps lose their uh, lose that system entirely. Um, but on the plus side, they do, you know, one of the main driving motivations for being disconnected is that they have a sense of autonomy or there's a distrust of of uh, of government in general. Um, when they connect, they have to pay connection fees or a monthly bill. Uh, and it's often it is cheaper to to get them to connect to a system. But that's not always the case. Um, sometimes it is more cost effective to support disadvantaged users rather than having them connect. And that's typically the case for uh, for places where there may not be a municipal system at all or where a water system is really struggling to maintain their services. Um, there are lots of opportunities out there for funding. Uh, most of these are, are, are loans, some of them are grants, um, and they're all geared towards different uh, interested parties or different stakeholders. Some of them are more towards the community, some of them are more towards the households. But there are gaps in, in, in the funding opportunities. Uh, and I will just a couple quick notes where I see opportunities for, for further work. Um, I think there are opportunities for program evaluation to see what elements of the, all these different programs are working, what's not working. Um, and one other thing is that all these different programs, though they're meant to support disadvantaged users, they all define disadvantaged users in slightly different ways. And you know, not everyone, not you know, one person may be eligible for one, not the other, depending on what that definition. So I'll I'll leave it there and hand it over to Greg to, to continue the conversation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about you know further research on disparities facing centralized water and wastewater users coming to you from UCLA, uh, Department of Urban Planning, Water Resources for Boston Center. I'm going to talk pretty casually here, but based on some work we've been doing, uh, first of all, I want to you know note that we don't know much at the household level about who exactly is at you know state or national scale who exactly is relying on uh, wells or I'll just call them septic plus systems. If you want to call them on-site wastewater systems. As other people noted people have given different numbers um, on how what percentage of the U.S. population is reliant on wells and septic plus. Um, the best numbers I see on wells are 10 to 15 percent, but some people say it's a lot higher. And then, then we used a recent source, um, the American Housing Survey, to estimate um, only 15 percent are reliant on septic plus. But I know there's a new paper that just came out saying that maybe as high as 25 percent. All that to say, pretty shocking that we don't really know um, what the percentages are. Um, and we also don't know a whole lot, although we did a recent paper. Um, showing who's reliant on both these, um, and actually it was quite surprised in the paper we did at um, how few people or how many people are reliant on just a well and then a public sewer or just um, a septic and then public water. It's not all just you're reliant on uh, wells and septics or you're reliant on public public. There's quite a, a diversity there. And also we found when we looked um, sort of in terms of demographics, socioeconomics, um, I don't think it'll surprise a lot of you, um, very white population relying on wells and septics on average, although I know regionally it can be a lot different, Kelsey can say stuff about that, but also not on average um, lower income than the average US population. 
um, and not really a bimodal distribution either. Um, and that really matters again when you think about public support, public support programs that are increasingly, you know, trying to define by household income or disadvantaged community status. Um, again, you know, there's really two big buckets of potential solutions for wells or septic owners who, um, you know, have systems that are either equivalent of being out of compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act or Clean Water Act. Um, first of all, there's consolidation, and then there's in-situ solutions. Really, um, consolidation is a huge buzzword in the U.S. right now, particularly on the drinking water side. Everyone's talking about consolidation, potential for consolidation. Very few people have looked at what actually happens when you consolidate systems and household experiences pre-post. So we, namely Kelsey, leading the paper, did a, a paper, a small sample in New York, looking at when well users get connected to a public system, what happens. Basically, uh, as we would hope, because it's the whole premise, water quality does get a lot better. People perceive water quality to be a lot better. They consume uh, more of the water when they're connected to the tap. Uh, the downside is they really don't like the price. They didn't anticipate the price, even though the price was messaged to them. So there's a huge negative sort of perception on affordability. Part of that may be ironically that folks were getting um, free bottled water uh, before they were connected. Um, so that price difference is even more stark um, than it might be otherwise. Uh, we also do a lot of work at UCLA, uh, particularly working in the state of California on these massive needs assessments, trying to estimate uh, everyone in the state who is relying on private wells and has, again, water quality of uh, the equivalent of out of compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act, um, and then model potential solutions, including consolidation for those folks. The main thing I want to emphasize is that not nearly um, even 50% on the drinking water side, and now we're doing this on the wastewater side, I'm sure the percentage will be higher, are anywhere close enough to centralized systems to possibly connect. It doesn't, they're not within five to 10 miles. Economically, it's never gonna happen. So you have to either think about forming a new utility or in situ solutions. And there I'd say like, we're nowhere in the US on this. Um, and you can see, you know, AR had a slide that showed a bunch of uh, funding programs, and that's true, but they add up to very little. Um, and even in the, the recent uh, bipartisan infrastructure law or investment, infrastructure investment and jobs act, uh, the funding for decentralized systems are called users here is 10% uh, lower, or it's only 10% equivalent to the population of what we see for centralized systems. They also remind you the EIL or infrastructure and Jobs Act isn't really, it's it's nice to tricky water industry, but it's like 10% of what the regulated utility um, sector needs. So we're talking about maybe 1% of needs of unregulated users being met here. And I think we need to get serious about scaling interventions. And that's what one of the uh, breakout groups will discuss um, to meet the needs and meet the challenges that unregulated users um, on both the drinking water and wastewater side are facing. With that, I'm turning it back over to you. Well, with that, we're turning over to the lightning talks. Uh, we had, well, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, six talks. Amazing people, amazing work. Um, who would like to go first? Seven, wonderful. Mm -hmm. While AR is getting the slides up, I'll just go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Evan Kane. I'm the manager of a local health department uh, private well program in Wake County, North Carolina, just down the road, the Capital County. Me, Thank you. Uh, and I'm joined today by our hydrogeologist, Rachel Natali, sitting here in the second row. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. I'll be really quick. Uh, but I'd like to make a point that Wake County is a microcosm for private wells nationally, at least in terms of who is served and the challenges they face. We are not a microcosm in terms of the level of investment that we have applied to the problem. Uh, your mileage may vary in your county. Uh, so, Wake County, uh, we are served by, we think we have about 40,000 private wells in service, currently serving about 90,000 people. That equates to 9% of our population. Um, these are not a vestige of some rural past. We are installing 300 new private wells each year, roughly. We field about 300 requests from individual households for us to come out and collect a fairly comprehensive suite of water quality tests each year. We also, like the national situation, have a fairly diverse uh, well user population. Red here means poor economic health by census block group. Blue means richer, essentially. And the size of the white dots is our estimated percent of people relying on private wells 
in those areas. So we have affluent communities up near Falls Lake Reservoir in the northern part of the county uh, where people are moving into the county and into the state and buying new houses with private wells. We also have people who were born into a house with a private well um, and have really no option but to continue staying there. We have uh, people with limited English proficiency living in rental housing, et cetera. Uh, in terms of governance and program support, a few things that really distinguish us. We were one of the first counties in North Carolina to begin requiring permits and inspections for new private wells. We started that in 1987. In 2004, we started adding required water quality testing. So it took that long even for us as a leader to get there. 2019, we uh, revamped that water quality testing significantly. We have a lab with two staff. We have a hydrogeologist on staff. I have three environmental health specialists out in the field doing inspections. We have extensive support from a GIS department uh, within the county government. We have data management support, et cetera. The state instituted required well permitting and inspection in 2008. All local health departments have to do this. Many view it as an unfunded mandate. The State Department of Health and Human Services provides oversight and guidance to the local health departments, and the Department of Environmental Quality responds to human caused contamination. Um, in Wake County, we've got about 2,300 known releases of contamination to soil or groundwater, and more than one in 10 wells exceed safe levels of uranium or radon from geogenic sources. You move to, say, Union County, it would be arsenic instead of uranium and radon, but uh, the geogenic sources are there everywhere you go. Um, we use the resources we've got to do things like extensive contamination review whenever we permit a well, and we set testing requirements based on that contamination review. Um, and we also have resources that we're able to use to do contamination investigation. We find contaminated wells that the state did not previously know about, and we fan out to neighboring households to let them know about the threat at the neighborhood scale. Um, and then we actually even have the resources once in a while to do something like notify half of the well users in the county, 19,000 uh, in this case in 2019, about the potential for radionuclides uh, in their well water. A big theme of our program is removing barriers for well users. Um, so we do things like we've bundled our tests into packages to promote comprehensive testing, rather than trying to discern the difference between chloroform and coliform for someone who doesn't really know anything about water quality. We've got income-based discounts for testing fees. We have a lot of linkages to funding and financing programs and try to help people connect to those. And we even have instituted a pilot program within the county with ARPA money to help pay for repairs for wells and septic systems. And we make ourselves available to talk to basically any audience that will have us. Uh, real estate professionals are a big one we like to talk to because that's the, that may be the only time people think about where their water comes from when they're buying a house. And then a big part of our role, we start, see ourselves in as a liaison between the well user and myriad other agencies, whether it's state, uh, local, municipal utilities, et cetera. We try to at least be the first point of contact and then say, we know who needs to be involved next. And getting to challenges from my perspective, uh, sitting here eight years with the health department, uh, empowering local health department is a big thing. We have tremendous resources in Wake County that most health departments do not have. Uh, we've got the staffing, we've got the awareness, expertise, we have data management systems, GIS support, we're aware of funding and financing opportunities. Most local health departments in North Carolina, which I think is a leading state for private wells, don't have anything close to that. Empowering well owners as water system operators. Most well owners are not aware that they are a water system operator or that that is the paradigm that society has selected for them to operate under. Um, private sector awareness, I'll single out doctors, especially do not know the health risks that their patients are facing from their well water. And even when you get all this stuff in, in line, if the community is not of one mind, but they are a community, then you're gonna be 
uh, limited in the solutions you have available to you. Um, you've got the challenges of overburdened and underserved populations. They've got many other things to worry about. Um, and then finally, I throw out there siloed responses to public health and environmental threats. And that's specifically around the limited scope that environmental regulators have when they go into a community to say there is contamination. They may be going after PFAS and missing the uranium, missing the arsenic, and not making people aware and giving people a sense that I've had my water tested, it's safe. I'll leave it to whoever's next. Thanks. Who would like to go next? So, yeah, wonderful. Thank you. All right, so as we're getting set up, I'm Leanne Kermitis and I'm at Virginia Tech. And so my group, with Kelsey and some of her early other compatriots. We do with well water, we do basic surveillance for emerging contaminants of concern. PFAS absolutely haunts our dreams and nightmares, as <laughs> everyone has been saying. I have someone, one of my grad students, talking about PFAS on Wednesday right here in Wells. We do some work in linking to actual health outcomes, but I'm going to leave that for Dr. Cohen, who's really the leader, and I'm going to make him go next. <laughs> so, predictors, sorry, I'm always the comic relief. Sociodemographic predictors that folks have been talking about. Um, but I kind of figured everyone would be talking about that. So I'm going to focus on these two new things that I'm thinking about. One of them is how people cope with having inadequate water supply. And the other is the economics of providing for safe drinking water. So the first is that water is an inelastic need. So if you have water, lots of us talked about how people might have geogenic contaminants, E. coli, PFAS, whatever, that doesn't mean you suddenly have no water needs. Well, what happens next? Maybe you go and rely on a more primitive source like a dug well, because that's all that's available. Maybe you start collecting rainwater. We know that rainwater has mixed health impl implications. Maybe you go try to work collecting water from a roadside spring. My group has done a ton of work monitoring the roadside springs, spoiler, they're not springs. Um, that's a, there you go. That's another story. And of course, there's always bottled water. Bottled water may be safe. Bottled water is incredibly expensive. Chances are, if you're a very rural disadvantaged population, bottled water is going to be far away. I also have students at 3.30 talking about the economics and health safety of bottled water if you want to check it out. So the best way to exemplify this is I did some work with Big D, who's around here somewhere also awesome, and was doing a survey in West Virginia and asking this very basic question, which I ignorantly had, you know, just a few multiple choice answers I was coding. What water do you drink? And the people said, well, wait a minute, what season? Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. And they said, look, it doesn't matter what time of the year, what comes out of my tap is what I'm going to use for cleaning my house, cleaning my dishes. But if it's the summer, I'm going to go use that roadside spring for all my actual potable water use. Meanwhile, in the winter, I like to use that spring if the road is clear. If there's ice or I can't reach it, then I'm going to go back to a dug more primitive well because it's on my property and I have more trust in it. This is something that has started to be documented in other countries called supplemental unimproved source use. This is not something we acknowledge happens in the United States. And this makes it very difficult then to predict health outcomes because when I ask you what water is served in your home, what if that's not the actual water you're drinking? And we just haven't gotten to this place yet in the US. Though I'm sure all of you, I see lots of nods, know this happens. The other thing is how much it costs. We know how to protect a well. These are the fantastic 10, well, 10 ways to keep your well safe that our cooperative extension program puts out. They're fantastic time you know, tried and true, but we do not know how much that costs. We don't even really know how much centralized water truly costs in the United States. We right. absolutely don't know how much well water costs. Kelsey brought up people were irritated that they had water bills. They probably didn't know how much they were spending on their wells already. We also do not know who pays. And it's important that we think of this because household income does shape what's possible. Lots of us, self-included, when we start doing well water programs, we end up taking samples from convenience that oversample from wealthier populations. 
We are doing some work with uh, on a grant funded by Virginia Environmental Endowment. And this is very preliminary data, so it's like in Excel and not pretty. But what we're seeing is that if you look at treatment by um, income, right? People who are making close to $100,000 or more, three quarters of them have treatment. And notice that that links in health-based or treatment for really conditioning purposes. Less than half in our lowest bracket, so less than 50,000, have treatment. So we know that income shapes what's possible and what people are drinking at the tap. And I hope that I was under three minutes. And now I'm giving it to Alistair, who doesn't get to the time. <laughs> Thank you for the nice introduction. I'm um, Alistair Cohen, also of Virginia Tech. Um, so while the slide's loading, I have a background slide more just to kind of introduce myself and how I came to this. But most of most of my work um, originally was in low middle income country context, worked for a few UN agencies doing work around um, indicators and metrics around rural poverty for monitoring and evaluation and also access to water or water resource management. Thank you. Um, all right. And so just so that's that's some of the work I did in a, a previous life. And one of the main things I did was developing a tool, the multidimensional poverty assessment tool to better understand multi, multiple dimensions of rural poverty. And this is something I retired from, but still collaborate with uh, with UN colleagues, and we're still doing some analysis. With data sets from Sub Saharan Africa. I tell you this just to say that my perspective as a practitioner and as an academic has always been on lower income rural areas and looking at issues around water and poverty in the interplays. Um, I my research uh, for about the last 10 years has been with the China CDC. That's not what I'm going to talk to you about now, but it informs a lot of my approaches to doing wash related work in Appalachia. And so this uh, also focusing in lower income rural communities. A number of different uh, parts of the country and looking at access to water, seasonal differences, household water treatment, different methods of effectiveness. And this work ultimately culminated in a, a 900 household randomized control trial that we started in 2017. Two years of follow up. My last time in China was 2019, right before the pandemic hit China. And then uh, happy to discuss on the side, but as a result of the pandemic and some other factors, uh, my work with China CDC is, is paused for the moment, though we're still collaborating on uh, the analysis of, of this trial and some other desk-based projects, but no field work at the moment. Uh, that, that, that's changing, but again, ask me if you're interested in that, that longer conversation. So coming uh, to Virginia Tech, one of the main reasons I was excited to come to Virginia Tech is I wanted to look at wash issues in the domestic context. I've done some work in rural California, and I, I knew or thought I knew that this was a challenge in the Appalachia region. And so one of the first things uh, we did, and thanks very much to my fantastic PhD student, Amanda, who led the systematic review, we wanted to see what's been done over 20 years across the Appalachia region. So uh, Amanda has a poster on this, so I'd encourage you to speak with her if you have more detailed questions. But big picture, we found, uh, yeah, well, we found a lot of things, but I'll just share one, not that many studies. This is primary data studies over 20 years. Not that many focused on health, of those very few that were kind of designed maybe more by an epidemiologist, so only a handful of cohort studies. And ultimately our conclusion was we couldn't draw conclusions about water quality or associated health outcomes in any of the regions of Appalachia. In particular in central Appalachia, where our research is focused, including with Dr. Kamitas, very few studies, about half of which are, are Dr. Kamitas. <laughs> Okay, so, so what are we doing uh, more recently in our group? So we have a, a few uh, studies that we've done, cross-sectional prospective cohort, um, and uh, also a wastewater-focused study in Southwest Virginia. So I'm just gonna share with you results from a couple of those studies now. And I think that it very much fits into everything we've heard so far. So, far. Uh, so one of these studies, let's see. So one, we did a study just focused on well water users, and this was in collaboration with the county utility we wanted to expand access, and as we've heard, was struggling to figure out because of the high cost connection how to pay for that. And so, fortunately, this worked out well. Now, they might have got the funding without us anyway, but it didn't hurt that we found the water was very contaminated in this community. And those findings went into their reports and applications for funding, and they have expanded the water supply. And we'll do a follow up to find out what we already know utility water is better than contaminated well water. Uh, there, though, we, we also, in addition to looking at, and we have a paper on this if anyone's interested. 
In addition to looking at a number of the kind of more typical parameters, we also, um, with UVA, did some PCR analysis. And surprisingly, we found a number of enteric pathogens, Aromotis, Campylobacter, and Terabacter in well water samples. Now, about more than half of these households were not drinking their well water. They were drinking bottled water, which is a whole other line of our research and my research internationally as well, which I think I'm glad to see there's kind of increased attention to that as a secondary source of drinking water. Uh, so also in this area, and I should mention, these are very low income households. Sorry, th this map is from our uh, nonprofit partner for this uh, cohort study, along with East Tennessee State University, UVA, UVA Wise, and others. And these are two uh, very overall high aggregate low income uh, counties. The households in the study, about half of them, their reported annual income is less than $20,000 a year, so very low income. Um, this study, we're looking not just at well water, but households on utility water, nine different community water systems across the two counties, um, well water and spring water. And so here, I realize the figure is a little small, uh, but essentially we found what would not be a surprise, I think, to many in this room. Uh, fortunately, the utility water looked pretty good overall. We have another side study looking at uh, chlorine residuals and disinfection byproducts, some minor issues. But I think that's a challenge in any rural area where you have utilities providing water over such a long distance and, and the travel time is so long. Um, but so we saw the E. coli contamination was highest in the spring water and then also in the well water. Fortunately, in this area, we didn't really see much of an issue with metals. That has a lot to do with those discuss the hydrogeology in the region and also the home premise plumbing. So we test, we get three, three sets of samples from each household to control for impacts from premise plumbing. We also collected uh, saliva swabs, and these results, this is in collaboration with EPA, and I have a really pretty figure, but I thought it's only fair that I get their blessing before I share any of this publicly. So um, these are these are some of the outcomes that we, so we have, this is 33 households, 83 individuals, 48 of which agreed to provide saliva samples, 44 of which we were able to analyze. And so we saw, I was a bit surprised by how much evidence of uh, stork infections with cryptosporidium we saw, Campylobacter wasn't as much of a surprise. Happy, we just saw one. Helico, I feel like that's not so surprising. Probably half the room has had stark infections with Helicobacter. And then norovirus, almost everybody had one of, you know, under eight different variants of norovirus. But this, combined with other reported health outcome data we had from individuals, including on uh, seven-day uh, diarrhea, these rates are high. And even for a limited income country context, these are relatively high. So in both of these studies with only 18 and, and 83 individuals, about 10, 11%. Now, the usual caveat supply, this is, you know, there's a recall bias and other factors involved. We did see associations in one study with E. coli detection and not in the other. And that also kind of aligns with the literature. E. coli is not always a reliable predictor of uh, gastrointestinal upset. Uh, lastly, I'll just mention, uh, we're also doing some work, um, also led by Amanda and others, but you also have a talk on that um, Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, looking at wastewater-based wastewater surveillance, but in rural areas. So better understanding how do we need to characterize uh, or how could one characterize uh, sewer sheds to understand, can you sample, there's much more to it, but simply put, can you sample just the wastewater treatment influence and get a reliable, reliable signal of pathogen trends, or do you need to sample at multiple points in the sub-sewer shed? Um, and what type of sampling? Is gravity, you get the gravity going to be enough or do you need to do composite samplers? There's a lot more to it. I think it's really fascinating work. I'm biased, of course, but please speak with Amanda if you have questions. Um, I'll just wrap up by saying we, we have a number of uh, future projects, planned projects with Virginia Department of Health, with another um, healthcare provider in the region, including with East Tennessee State University. And our big picture perspective is for focusing, now we're shifting to focus on households on well water and spring water where the cost per connection, the utilities are telling us it's a bit too high, right? So it's kind of think like I think many of us are in the room for, well, what are some alternative strategies? So one, I just want to throw out there for potential discussion later, which is not something um, we're doing right now, but I'd be interested to. From my time in China, there's a company there, and I'm not recommending this company, but just the model that they use. So it's essentially modular microfiltration. And so this is a decentralized approach for centralized treatment, but with decentralized management and oversight. So they have these kind of buildable, stackable modules that can be scaled based on the rural population served. There's nothing too fancy with the treatment, microfiltration, 
And then they use cell signals to monitor physical chemical parameters uh, like pH, total suspended solids. And then if they do see an issue, they send a centralized technician out to provide service. So again, maybe that's a stretch to think about for somewhere in the States, but hopefully that's the kind of thing we could talk about today. Thank you. Andrew, you want to go next, sir? Hello, everybody. I'm Andrew George, a community engagement coordinator at the Institute for the Environment, part of the Superfund Research Team's Community Engagement Core. Nice. <laughs> One rep. All right. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about some of the work that we've been doing over the past eight or so years, looking at private wells in North Carolina. Um, maybe this is kind of a small case study on how potentially you could think through the process of recruiting people, checking out their water, seeing what's going on with the contamination, and then moving them toward uh, centralized water systems. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, though, what we've been doing here, uh, we've tested almost about 2,000 wells over the past eight years, generally um, around uh, bad actors. So we've had a lot of, in North Carolina, we've had some experiences with coal ash. I'm sure you all have probably heard about that. Yes? Okay. Uh, we've also had some hurricanes. So when you have these kind of different impacts, it's easier to get people recruited, thinking about drinking water, um, as opposed to, for example, where we've been mostly been doing some work more recently in Union County down there on the bottom left, where we've been, um, bottom left, where we've been uh, thinking about arsenic contamination in Union County, uh, geogenic contamination. Um, we've known that there's set, uh, potential exposure from uh, our state in Union County for over a decade, but nobody's really been doing a lot of testing in there, aside from the health department who needed some help. So we stepped in, partnered with the health department, um, started a well testing initiative, and we recruited about 225 people. 20% of the wells were above the MCL for arsenic, maximum contaminant level for arsenic. Now, those are levels that are set for public water utilities. They're not strictly based on public health. So if you're actually managing your water for your family, you're not going to be making all these trade-offs for what it costs to serve 1,000 or 10,000 people. You're worried about your direct impacts on your family. So you don't want any arsenic in your water. And you can see here that in addition to the 20% or so above the MCL, we had a substantial portion of people in the level with at least some detectable levels of arsenic many of which had children in their homes. So in order to do this study, we you know, just did general recruiting with the health department. We sent out a way to people, you know, have people sign up um, online. We worked with a group called Clean Water from North Carolina. It's an established 40-year NGO in the state that we've got a lot of experience with. Hope Taylor was one of their executive directors. And then in addition to recruiting, once we got the results back, we immediately sent people a note saying, hey, stop drinking your water. You've got arsenic off, you know, off charts. We don't say that, but basically, hey, there's some, something going on with your water please let us send you a pitcher filter. So in the short, short term, we give these people these, uh, these pitcher filters called zero water pitcher filters. We test them in the lab. We have no financial uh, connection to the company, but they work really, really well. And the company's actually hooked us up with free filters in the past for some other campaigns that we worked on uh, following some of the hurricanes. So call people up, tell them about their water. We send them a pitcher filter. And then we also invite them to the community meeting and they come to the meeting, they get to meet some of their other people. And then we show them what's going across the, the county because they don't know what's going on with their neighbors because all participants are invited and everything's private, which is one reason I think it's more, you know, UNC does a pretty good job of recruiting people because we keep all the results private. If you test with the county, it goes up on public, it goes up online. It's free, and of course, we're Carolina, so go Tar Heels, everybody trusts them. <laughs> um, so we get this good community meeting going. We bring the scientists there who are part of the study. So Dr. Rebecca Fry, the Superfund Research Director, um, was at this meeting, as well as uh, Dr. Gray, who's also a communications expert. We explain the results in a way that hopefully is easily understood at, by a lay audience. Um, and then uh, we get them talking. And so one of the things that came out of this meeting uh, was... They took the results to their town council. So one of the particular examples is a town called Indian Trail. Uh, about a certain community there called Moore, Moore Park had about 20 participants in our study from that community. They all got together, they shared the results and it turned out a substantial portion of them were above or had contaminated contamination from arsenic. Um, and so they took the results, the county, the town decided that they wanted to actually approve waterline extensions to this particular community. They had some money in ARPA that, that had been uh, provided for another project because it was kind of slowly moving its way through the pipeline. They were able to direct redirect some of that toward uh, waterline extensions. So they're going to be able to provide about half a million dollars 
to hook up these participants who were part of our study with public water lines if the county comes around and does the other half. So there's still, of course, some more work to do. But as an example of how you can kind of go from recruiting people, explaining what they've got, and then making a decision about whether or not to, to you know, knowledge is power, use that knowledge to go to their town council and make some changes. That's kind of a, you know, one small example of how we've been able to do it. Uh, we've also looked at some other examples in North Carolina, Wake County, there's a community called Apex, which also went through this whole process, a really interesting case study. We did some interviews there and it turns out like they did the same similar process, but uh, fortunately they had some really great support from the county. They had some support from the town. UNC was also doing some testing and they got water line extended, but then they didn't get the wastewater extended. So now they're actually dealing with too much wastewater and uh, there's some issues with that. So I also want to just mention that in addition to some of these good case studies, there are a lot of other examples where people don't want to get hooked up to public water because the water might not necessarily be any cleaner. Okay. Let me say that again. Sometimes private wells can be cleaner than public water. Okay. In North Carolina, if you're drinking water next to the, you know, Pittsburgh, there's the Hall River. The Hall River is substantially contaminated with 1,4-dioxin, with PFAS that we know about. So I just wanted to flag that sometimes this calculation is not an automatic slam dunk, hook them up public water, everything's going to be fine. Sometimes a lot of these private, you know, decentralized systems have good water. But in cases like arsenic and in cases of PFAS and some of the other examples, radiologicals in, in Wake County, obviously there's going to be a really easy solution or uh, a direct solution to much public water. It's just the steps of getting there. So that was our example. I'd love to tell you more about it. There's some of our research and I'll hand it off to the next lightning person. We've got two more, two more lightning sessions. I'll have the next if that's okay. Uh, sure. Um, wait, give me one second. Uh, Let's uh, do you want to, yeah. what other Emily going? I can do this now. Sure. Uh, Joe, you want to come? Or, yeah. uh, hey, everybody. I'm Joe Brown. I'm with UNC. I just read everybody's name, so I know all of you now. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm setting a timer because I love to go set my own voice. Um, <laughs> So I've been, um, I work in two areas that are um, related to underserved communities in the U.S. Most of my work is international, like Alice here. Um, but I work uh, in WASH uh, among people living with homelessness, experiencing homelessness, and also in uh, rural underserved communities. And the one that I work in uh, the most is in Alabama. So Alabama's Black Belt, which is, it happens to be where I'm from. And that's the reason why I'm working there. A um, few things that we've um, that we found out about these communities over the last 15 years we've been working there is, um, yeah, the wells are not good. Um, the drinking water supplies themselves, the utilities are, are providing water that's often not safe to drink as well. Um, and the sanitation situation is, is really bad. As bad as the water situation is, you know, this whole area is a place where the geology is very unfavorable to on-site sanitation. And so there are a lot of failing septic systems and a lot of straight pipes. Some of the counties down there in this area have as much as 50% of households uh, using straight pipe. That is to say, um, you know, uh, no containment of domestic wastewater. So I'm just going to describe like one very small part of an ongoing series of studies that we've been doing down there. Um, so one of the things I'm very interested in is exposure, right? So are, are people being, people who have really poor sanitation, insufficient uh, septic systems or straight piping, are they more at risk for exposure to enteric pathogens? And this is something that we really don't have any evidence on, right? So what we, one of the things we did with support from the CDC and working with UAB and some other uh, collaborators is we uh, went out and took um, a lot of stool samples from kids between the ages of two and 18 um, and looked at them by a microscopy, DPCR for specific pathogens, and a custom um, TAC assay that looks quantitatively across a whole range of pathogens that might be present in stool to understand whether you know those kids who are served, you know, who are unserved by good, san good sanitation or who uh, are drinking from wells are at greater risk of, um, of apparent exposure to these things. So I don't know if you can see this, but this is just our TAC results uh, from 488 children uh, that shows, you know, a lot of enteric pathogens being shed. Some of these are not so bad. Some of them are expected, some of them are unexpected. Uh, but one of the things uh, we saw was that, um, you know, kids with one or more pathogens present in stool is about uh, 127 out of uh, 488, so about 27% of samples positive. 
This compares the earlier cohort studies that have looked at this in kids in other countries, other contexts, and the other comparable data that we have on this is much lower across you know, combined prevalence for pathogens. So uh, for example, a study from Sweden, 3.7%, Australia, 4.6%. So there's a little bit of evidence that there's great, you know, kids here, or, see, I'm ready to my time. Um, <laughs> kids here are already shedding uh, quite a lot more pathogens. And when you look at risk factors, actually none of the sanitation uh, variables that we that we look at came up as being associated with greater exposure to enteric pathogens, but using well water does, right? So this is very interesting to us because you know we're we're sort of interested in whether um, sanitation infrastructure that's locally poor is getting into these wells, some of which are shallow wells, and ultimately ending up in a greater prevalence of exposure for kids who are um, in these communities. And this sort of squares with a lot of the research that we've done over the years on the relative uh, riskiness of, of well water contamination in this area. So, um, yeah, so thanks. A lot of the wells like that. It's bad news. We have two more presentations. Uh, Why are you going to say? I have your slides so you can go ahead. Yeah. Oh, Hi, everyone. So I'm Emily Kumpel from uh, the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I'm a professor in civil and environmental engineering. And much like uh, Joe and Alistair, a lot of my work was very internationally focused in low and middle income countries until arriving at UMass. And then, and especially in a rural area, and looking around, it's uh, working, starting some work with small water systems and private uh, well and septic owners, and realizing that a lot of the same challenges that I had been thinking about and addressing other places in the world were actually very, very relevant uh, right in my backyard. So I'd say three of the main themes that come up as I think really important areas, um, and, and ones that we work on in particular, is thinking about uh, kind of who has what where. So just sort of getting better data about in the US about who is actually on decentralized systems, but also a caveat, and I'll, I'll show some of what we're doing. We are getting to a very fine level, but I am very aware of some of the ethical implications of also making that data very public, um, especially at a very fine level um, because of potential for penalties or potential for um, uh, you know enforcement or also um, uh, housing values, a lot of things. So that's something we're still grappling with, uh, but it's something to sort of note as we're talking about these things, about getting better data. Um, and also how to support um, those that are on decentralized systems. So one other area is about decisions about things and, and the systems to maintain home water treatment or options for home water treatment um, and also other sorts of uh, uh, infrastructure at home, such as home storage. So I'll bring up two examples. Thank you. Um, so one is, uh, so we actually are funded by the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection and their well driller program to manually sort through their well drillers database and clean all of the locations. So, so there's a lot of wonderful undergrads <laughs> working many hours and going through tax assessor records and many details. We are 180,000 in, 200,000 in their database, uh, trying to actually parcel map all of these wells. So this is a, the current map. However, one note is if we go by uh, some of the, that 10, that, that 15 to 25 percent range um, of who might have wells, there's definitely at least two to three times more than are even in this database. So that'll be the next step is finding the missing wells, uh, which I know Kelsey has also been <laughs> investigating. Um, and then thinking about also um, digging into the demographics to try to answer some of these questions that we've been talking about, particularly for Massachusetts, about uh, how old are the houses that um, that are on wells versus on um, piped water connection, and what are the potential water quality, as well as there's some talk um, in action towards regulation, uh, much like Title V for uh, septic tanks, where when you sell a house, you would have to also provide an inspection and information about a well in Massachusetts. So thinking about some of the, the regulatory implications of this. Um, but this is uh, one thing we're trying to write up is even just explaining this process of working with all of these old state databases uh, and trying to actually dig through and sort of clean that up and see what information is in there from the 1960s and the 1950s about depth to bedrock and a whole bunch of notes in there. How can you actually clean that and make use of it? 
um, and then generate data that could be used in other places in order to map wells, which I'll get to with the next one, which is um, we are most of the way through a process to identify who in the US is on septic versus on site sanitation on a particle level. Uh, so working with uh, Greg soon um, in UCLA on this for California. But using publicly available data, such as road networks, uh, the ACS data, wastewater treatment plants, building foot pinch data layers, um, and machine learning to categorize if every single parcel needs sanitation infrastructure or not, and then if they are on site or sewer served. Uh, we did this using uh, machine learning, a random forest model with uh, many years uh, trying to perfect this model. Um, Florida had pretty good data about um, on a very a public data on um, like on most likely septic versus most likely on site. So we trained a model on Florida. Um, we are able to get a very good accuracy. So we basically in machine learning, you take a small amount of the data, like 10 or 20 percent as your training data, and then you test on the rest of it. So 80 or 90 percent, and then you know whether you're actually working or not. Um, so yeah, our average in Florida is at 97% with our last model. We actually took that same model and then working with some data from the Virginia Department of Public Health uh, from several of the counties, I think of actually about 15 counties in Virginia, where they actually did have data. We actually just used that model there and got 85% without any Virginia data. So we are in the process of scaling this up for California and for the rest of the country. So stay tuned, we will have parcel level data. But as I mentioned, there may be concerns with releasing parcel level data. So this is something that um, we would be dealing with, but it's a method that we think can work um, in many, many places. So obviously these are just two states, but um, there'll be more coming soon. And I think could work for private wells. So um, I think just having better information about trying to, to understand this uh, will be useful for planning and investment and just sort of and understanding who was served by what. Um, the other part I'll mention is sort of broadly about trying to weigh some of the, the trade-offs. Uh, we did a, a project recently on, um, this was actually for small water systems, so not decentralized, but this was systems that had, were regulated as a, a public water system, but uh, trying to understand, so these were ones that were out of compliance with Safe Drinking Water Act regulation, and they were trying to decide about whether they should improve the centralized source. Uh, so by they already had a centralized source. That, so it was about improving the treatment versus installing household water treatment in every single home or point of it. So either point of entry or point of use. Um, and actually some of the interesting implications I think for decentralized is it actually get to the, the model that Alistair mentioned earlier, because it involves, in, in order to do this in a, a regulated public water system, it would actually mean uh, centralized monitoring, centralized maintenance and repair, and all of these things that could actually be scaled out to those with uh, private wells. So we had four communities that we worked with, and this was a, we didn't actually implement, this is a model, but based on real places um, in four different uh, states across, in four different EPA regions, and actually compared a triple bottom line analysis of cost, environment, and health exposure. Uh, for centralized systems versus two different actual point of use or point of entry devices. Um, and by and large found that uh, often the cost was much cheaper for the centralized, but again, this was making an, a, a small improvement to an existing centralized source. So this would be very different if you were installing a brand new pipe network. Um, but in the process really also helped to identify some of the challenges with the household water treatment that is on the market. Never mind trying to even find which treatment might actually be uh, available to you and what it might actually treat and what sort of performance indicators. So I think there's actually a big room. I know um, internationally, there's been a lot of focus on household water treatment. I feel like not as much in the US. Uh, and there's a lot of room for improvement there um, for those on, on decentralized sources. Um, and also working currently with an EPA project with the Association of, Drinking, of um, State Water Drinking Water Administrators on state approvals and piloting in order of new and innovative technologies, particularly for small communities, but also for those on private wells, to try to understand how if you pilot a technology in one place, it could be approved in other place. Again, for decentralized systems, they don't necessarily need approval, but the state may still, there, there can still be a role in here in trying to collect data on which technologies might be most appropriate in most places. 
So that's probably my three minutes. <laughs> All right, so we have one more lightning <laughs> song, uh, <laughs> and then I think we're going to pivot to not doing breakout groups because we've had such a successful session here. We've had time. Uh, we're going to do a group discussion on both, uh, I guess, three things. First, the three themes that we're going to have breakout groups on. Secondly, if you have questions or comments for any of the speakers, and third, you know, you want to share uh, about your own work or pivoting off of this topic. Um, and then I'll also say, like, um, we thank you everyone for signing up. It's amazing how many people are in this room. We did, frankly, not expect as many people as we have here. So thank you all for coming. Um, we will email out the slides to everyone um, from the Lightning Talks. And we will also, I think, not DCC. So everyone will send out the actual email list so you all can connect with each other. But to be clear, we're not going to spam you. We're not trying to write one of those synthesis papers that I'm on 15 of at the group session. So there's not like a commitment by being on the list. That being said, if you for some reason don't want to be in a non DCC list, let me know and we'll we'll take you off that email. Um, are we close to? Yeah. Okay. And I'll turn it back over to Emily. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Emily Gardner. Uh, I'm going to give just a really quick overview of a couple of the things that my group is working on. I'm an assistant professor in civil and environmental engineering at West Virginia University, and we focus on topics related to water treatment, water infrastructure, and health. And so uh, I'm just going to mention a couple of the kind of themes that we work on. We care a lot about microbes in my group. And so sometimes that means looking at how they can be helpful for us in treating our water and systems like biofiltration. But unfortunately, more often we're uh, interested in how they're potentially harming people, what some of the threats are associated with microbial exposures. And so we uh, spend a lot of our time studying uh, drinking water distribution systems, looking at how microbes can grow in that environment. And specifically, we see that a lot of what we know about distribution systems comes from very large systems serving large cities. And there's a lot of reasons why that information isn't always directly transferable to small systems. Water use patterns are different. It takes a lot of miles of pipe to reach fewer people. And so water tends to sit in those pipes for longer. Uh, those systems tend to see a lot of water loss. All those things drive what we're finding uh, so far. Uh, my group also is interested in uh, some of the environments we find around us in West Virginia, where there's a lot of legacy mining activities and therefore acid mine drainage impacts. And so what we've seen is that this can be really impactful for how effective some of our tools are for being able to detect whether those microbes are there and whether they are a threat. And so we've got a project, um, hoping will be published soon, looking at how effective different methods are from culture to substrate coliform tests to QPCR in acid mine drainage impacted environments where we might have E. coli entering a viable but non-culturable state, for example, because of how much stress there is in that environment and how uh, effective that is for predicting uh, potential human health risks. Uh, we have also been uh, studying this, this topic of wastewater-based epidemiology but we're really interested in looking at this from the perspective of what some of the challenging infrastructure systems in our state kind of bring to bear in terms of unique problems for this. And so specifically, my, my student, uh, Chris, who's going to be talking about his work today at 3.30 in the Sunflower Room, uh, is going to be talking about combined sewer systems. We have a ton of these in West Virginia and what that means for dilution of viral targets that we're detecting through these methods and how we can use that to kind of better predict potential threats to human health. And then finally, my group also does some work related to antibiotic resistance coming from lots of different sources. Uh, and to pitch our side event tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. Uh, in the Azalea Room, we're going to be talking about methods for applying risk assessment to study uh, sources of environmental uh, antimicrobial resistance and what that means for human exposures. I also want to mention though some of the work we do at WVU uh, that is kind of out of the scope of research a little bit. We also do a lot of work uh, working with rural water and wastewater utilities to provide training and technical assistance. And so um, we have a USDA funded grant called the Appalachian Community Technical Assistance and Training Program. 
And what we do is really try to leverage some of the uh, knowledge that we have at the university through our uh, you know, varied land grant mission um, to kind of help provide support to utilities. And this can look, uh, you know, this can cover a variety of different topics. It can be effective utility management. It can be some traditional engineering topics, which is what I like to get into. But we also have collaborators in like the School of Law at WVU who can help with compliance or, uh, you know, lots of legal challenges can come up with managing utilities. And so we work with utilities in West Virginia for this, but we also have collaborators at Kentucky, University of Tennessee, Knoxville, most recently Virginia Tech, uh, who are doing the same sort of thing <laughs> with the Appalachian counties in their states. And then, you know, across the U.S., uh, we're seeing lots of challenges with workforce. You know, lots of our operators in this country are nearing retirement age, and utilities are having to grapple with what's next, who, you know, who's going to fill these positions. And this can be uh, particularly severe in rural counties, like a lot of the ones we see in our state, uh, where there might only be one or two operators. And so passing on that knowledge is really challenging. And so we also have a Department of Labor funded project that is helping to um, reach out to students in high schools and community technical colleges and recent graduates to help them understand what opportunities exist to them and give them opportunities to start to pursue jobs in the faculty. So that's all for me. Thanks. We have 20 minutes. All right. So rather than doing a big discussion, because again, we have way more people than we thought we would, I actually think we should go into groups. Um, so we're going to take three minutes and scaling, I can't, scaling water quality, where's the other one? Community resilience. Community resilience on that long. So there's a ton of us. Go find a new friend. I appreciate everyone who did a lightning talk. Those were absolutely phenomenal and really thought provoking. And so I would say we've got Again, 20 minutes, so let's move into the three groups and migrate as you see fit. Make a new friend. Go learn something cool. There's a ton of really re interesting work going on. And again, work that hasn't even been shared. So go into your groups. We will probably circle back up with AR for the last five minutes. So scaling, water quality, community. I just couldn't leave a discussion for 20 minutes. I'd much rather go with I didn't want to be Oh my gosh, hi, I'm Do you need to go from us?
ya <laughs> Thank you. 